welcome back for another video. Today I'll be talking about Harbor City Rifa. The Harbor City Rifas are largely a Mexican American street gang located in Harbor City, California. The Harbor City Rifas originated around the Harbor Village projects, formerly known as the Normont Terrence housing projects, which they share with the Harbor City Crips, an African American street gang who mainly feud with Latino gangs in Wilmington, Torrance, and San Pedro. The Harbor City Rifas have an alliance with the Harbor City Crips due to their common hatred toward Latino gangs in Torrance and Wilmington, such as the Torrance 204 Street Gang and the Wilmus Gang, located in the Wilmington District. The Harbor City Rifas also feud with the Rancho San Pedro Gang, another Latino street gang who mainly feud with the Dodge City Crips. The Harbor City Rifas and the Wilmus Gang have been beefing since 1990. Allegedly, a car full of Harbor City boys drove to Wilmington on a shooting spree looking for members of the Wilmus Gang. However, the Wilmus Gang gave pursuit and followed them back to Harbor City when another shootout took place, leaving one Harbor City boys dead. The Harbor City Reefers wanted revenge, which contributed to a string of shootings along the Pacific Coast Highway near the Harbor Village housing projects. At the time, it was estimated that there had been a total of 17 drive-by shootings and 4 gang-related deaths in Wilmington and Harbor City. The Harbor City Boys and the Wilmers Gang have been feuding for over 20 years and show no interest in a peace treaty. On a night as violent as any in recent memory in the Harbor area, 8 people were shot, 5 of them juveniles, 2 of them critically in gang drive-by shootings. In the shootings, as police describe, are part of an increase in gang violence that has shattered whatever calm existed in the Harbor communities of Wilmington, Harbor City, Harbor Gateway, in San Pedro. Gang violence in the area soared to an all-time high with more than 720 felony crimes and 21 killings, far above the 591 felonies and 14 murders in 1990. The first occurred just before 9 p.m. when an unidentified 16-year-old Harbor City youth was hit twice by gunfire from a passing car. The youth, who suffered serious but not life-threatening injuries, was shot at 255th Street in Normandy Ave. Within the hour, another youth, believed to be 16 or 17, was shot near 3rd and Center Streets in San Pedro. The youth was never identified by police because he left the local hospital before their arrival. The most dramatic of the shootings occurred about 9.20 p.m. in East Wilmington near a tough industrial pocket known as Ghost Town when six reputed gang members from that part of town were hit by gunfire from a slow moving car. On November 20th, 2015, police responded to a report of an armed with deadly weapon at a 24 hour gas station at 227th Street and Western Avenue in Torrance. No victim or suspect was present when they arrived. They saw a gunshot hole in a rear wall of the gas station and blood next to it. Near one of the pumps, they saw two additional gunshot holes and three 9mm casings. The gas station clerk told police they were assisting a female customer at the window when a Hispanic man walked up with a skateboard and slammed it on the ground. A male Hispanic at the pumps pointed a gun and yelled expletive that I'm going to get that expletive and fired three or four shots in the direction of the pumps. The cashier dropped to the ground and heard three more gunshots, possibly from another gun. The gas station was equipped with more than a dozen motion activated security cameras. Police testified that the soundless video was played for the jury. The video depicted the victim's light colored sedan arrive first and pull up to a pump in the second row, farthest from the cashier's window. The passenger side was next to a pump. An SUV pulled through the lane adjacent to the cashier window and turned around, parking in the lane between the two rows of pumps, with the driver's side next to a pump. The victim walked toward the cashier window. The gang member looked to the rear of his vehicle and walked to the cashier's window. A woman was already there. He appeared to be holding a firearm, but the victim's hands were empty. The two men appeared to exchange words. Fernando Lozano, a member of the Harbor City Boys gang, refused to answer any police questions. Alejandro Jimenez belonged to the Eastside Torrance gang. On December 15, police executed a search warrant for a residence in Torrance. Police located an SUV in the garage that matched the VIN number. It was registered to Alejandro. 
The vehicle had paper plates on it, and the rear windshield was shattered. Police left the vehicle in the garage and monitored the house in an attempt to locate Alejandro. Later, police were in patrol in uniform in a marked police vehicle. Police noticed a familiar blue Ford SUV near 221st Street in Harvard and Torrance. Police had stopped Alejandro three to four times before and recognized the SUV as belonging to Alejandro. The car usually had license plate on it, but this time it displayed paper plates. Police made aware Alejandro was one in connection with an attempted murder. They turned on their police car overhead lights, which activated the patrol car's front-facing video camera. Alejandro sped away as soon as police turned on the lights. They gave pursuit, and the entire chase was recorded. The pursuit video was played without the sound for the jury. Alejandro made numerous vehicle code violations during the chase, which traverse streets include a stretch on the southbound 110 freeway, where speeds record 100 miles per hour. The pursuit ended after Alejandro exited the freeway, crashed into a curb, and hit a building. Alejandro was taken into custody. Alejandro Jimenez was sentenced to 26 years to life in prison. Kevin Harvey was parking his car at 2 o'clock in the morning on July 3, 2009 in Harbor City when he was approached by two men who asked him, Where are you from? Harvey, aware that he was in a territory claimed by a gang and then questioned was a gang challenge, told them he did not gang bang. The two men then asked, Where can we find some Harbor Cities to kill? Nervous, Harvey responded, Fuck Harbor City. Even though his children lived there and he was visiting them. The two men assaulted Harvey after telling them that they were from Harbor City. The man punched Harvey in the face and pushed him down into a curb as they began stomping on him. Harvey identified one of the men as the defendant who then pulled a gun from his pocket and told Harvey to take off his chain and his ring. The man also took his wallet and cell phone then drove away. Harvey suffered a swollen lip, black eye, short term memory loss and other injuries including the loss of partial dentures. As Harvey was looking for his dentures, which had fallen out during the assault, the two men drove back and handed Harvey some of his belongings. However, they said they would keep his chain of money because he had disrespected their neighborhood. Harvey believed they returned because they saw from his driver license address that he lived in Harbor City. After the assault, while looking for his dentures, Harvey found an identification card on the ground with the name Miguel Guerrero on it. The next morning, Harvey took the card to a man named Alvarez who was known to be affiliated with the Harbor City Boys gang. Harvey wanted Alvarez to help him get his chain and money back. Harvey was unwilling to call the police because he feared for his family's safety. Alvarez said he knew the personal identification card and that he would try to get Harvey's belongings back. After he took his children to the Los Angeles Sports Arena for a 4th of July celebration, Harvey was treated for his injuries at the Kaiser Permonte Emergency Center. Before he was released, however, the staff reported the assault to police as mandated by law. Although he was still reluctant to involve the police, Harvey spoke with the police over the telephone while at the hospital and then filed a report at the Harbor Division Police Station on August 11th. He subsequently identified Jose Borquez and Miguel Guerrero from two photograph lineups. Police executed a search warrant at Borquez's home in Harbor City. They were told he had been last seen running down an alley. Borquez was later arrested hiding in the attic of his uncle's house nearby. Miguel Guerrero was still at large at the time of the trial. On December 22, 2009, the jury convicted Jose Borquez of second-degree robbery and found true the crime was committed for the benefit of a street gang. He was sentenced to serve 16 years in state prison. In September of 2009, Alex Malinov was storing equipment from his vending machine business in a unit at a storage facility located on West 260 Street in Harbor City. He had an agreement with the owner of the facility to live on site, acting as a security guard. On the evening of September 3rd, 2009, Mr. Malinov was involved in an altercation with the defendant at the facility. There was no dispute that Mr. Malinov suffered a grievous injury to his neck, as well as additional lacerations above the head and chest from the altercation with the defendant, and that the defendant is the individual who inflicted those injuries. The material disputed facts concern whether the defendant acted in self-defense or premeditation, whether he was a current member of the Harbor City Boys Gang, and whether the attack was gang related. Mr. Malinov said Caesar Daniel Chavez then paused and sort of stood up straighter and told Mr. Malinov to apologize to him after he had disrespected him. Caesar said, I am from Harbor City. I'm a Harbor City gang member. Mr. Malinov did not understand exactly what that was supposed to mean, so he said jokingly, I'm from Harbor City also, and smiled at Caesar. 
He said Caesar repeated that he had apologized to Caesar for disrespecting him. Mr. Malinov asked him what he was supposed to apologize for since he had merely given him a cigarette. At that point, Caesar grabbed the cigarette out of his mouth and threw it back through the fence at Mr. Malinov saying, here's your cigarette and go to your hole, which Mr. Malinov understood to mean he should go back to his storage unit. Mr. Malinov testified that he was starting to become a little anxious and told Caesar that he did not take orders from him and that they should just go their separate ways. Mr. Malinov became more worried, ran towards storage unit and picked up a can of pepper spray and a pair of handcuffs he had sitting on a chair and then headed toward the gate to attempt to close it. He struggled with the gate because his motorcycle was in the way. Caesar arrived at the gate and immediately started swinging at Mr. Malinov's head and chest with his hands or fists. Mr. Malinov did not notice whether Caesar was holding anything in his hands. Mr. Malinov suffered a gruesome and gaping wound across his throat, plus additional lacerations to his head and chest. He was treated at the scene by paramedics and then transported to Harbor UCLA Trauma Center because of his potentially life-threatening injuries, which required emergency surgery to repair. Paramedics with some 21 years of experience testified the wounds appeared to be had been made by a sharp blade, like a box cutter, or perhaps a knife. They also testified Mr. Malinov was cooperative and did not display any signs of toxication. Police testified once on scene, they received word that a possible suspect by the nickname Toker was in the area. Police allowed to testify the general information lying in the field about the call. They explained that moniker was a nickname in gang culture. They also testified they had prior contacts with the defendant, Toker, including one in May 2009 and one on September 3, 2009, a few hours before the incident. Both encounters were consensual, and during both contacts, Toker admitted his membership into the Harbor City Boys gang. The jury returned a verdict, finding him guilty of both charges and finding all special allegations true. Caesar Daniel Chavez was sentenced to a term of life with possibility of parole for attempted first degree murder and they also imposed a consecutive three year term for the great bodily injury enhancement plus another year for the use of a deadly weapon enhancement. All total 15 years in prison had to be served minimum to be eligible for parole. Click on these other videos to watch some more interesting cool videos.